You're watching Economics Amplified, the latest thinking on the biggest issues from UChicago's Becker Friedman Institute. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening uh, on behalf of the Becker Friedman Institute uh, at the University of Chicago. My name is Stephen Davis. I'm a professor and deputy dean at the Chicago Booth School. Uh, as everyone here knows, uh, for decades, the University of Chicago uh, economics community has contributed fundamental insights uh, that have transformed policy, uh, economic science, markets, and business. And uh, the Institute uh, exists, the Becker Friedman Institute exists to advance more of that type of transformational research uh, and outreach. It does that in many ways. I won't try to describe here all the ways in which it does that, except to note that one of the ways it does that is to bring uh, world-class uh, economists and scholars uh, to talk about issues of broad public concern uh, to audiences like this one. <clears throat> So tonight's talk today is also uh, part of a program at the Becker Friedman Institute uh, to study the ver various costs and effects of policy uncertainty, uh, especially uh, as they relate to economic issues. Um, there are several of us, uh, including Lars Hansen, uh, myself, uh, and others at the University of Chicago who are looking at, into the effects of uncertainty about what policymakers will do, uh, uncertainty about what the effects of their actions will be, uh, protect, and perhaps especially apropos to tonight's talk, uncertainty about whether policymakers will do anything uh, in the face of uh, certain uh, difficult economic problems. So uh, tonight we have a speaker who has um, uh, uh, spent uh, a good chunk of his career uh, investigating economic and policy issues related to uh, climate and climate change and global warming. Uh, that is certainly uh, closely connected to the types of uncertainty that I just mentioned before. Uh, there's uncertainty about the severity and the timing of adverse effects from climate change. There's uncertainty about uh, whether policymakers will respond and how they will respond. There's uncertainty about what the effects of policy responses will be. So I see tonight's uh, presentation is both speaking uh, to the broader mission of the Becker Friedman Institute and uh, the particular focus on policy uncertainty. In fact, I cannot think of a uh, speaker uh, who is uh, better equipped uh, to talk about the economic aspects of climate change policy uh, than uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Bill Nordhaus. So let me just say a few words. He's a, a very distinguished and accomplished economist, and I, I, I will not pretend that I'm going to cover all that ground, but I would like to say a few things. He is uh, the Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale University. Um, and he's also has an appointment in uh, the School of uh, uh, Forestry and in, in Environment, uh, Environmental Studies at Yale. Uh, he's been at Yale for a while. Um, he was an undergraduate student there. Um, I won't say exactly when. Uh, Bill can tell you if he wants to. Um, and then he's returned to Yale after completing his uh, PhD in economics at MIT. And let's say, just say he's been at Yale for decades. Um, <clears throat> Among his many distinctions, I'll just uh, uh, recite a few, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he's also a distinguished fellow of the American Economics Association, uh, which is, I think, the premier association of research economists around the world. Um, he is currently serving as president uh, of the American Economic Association. Um, his, uh, his research covers many areas, but in particular environmental studies and uh, climate change, uh, global warming. These are topics that have occupied his attention for decades. He's written many books, and I, I, brought, I brought one. This is his most recent book, I believe, and I, I recommend it highly. Those of you who are sitting in the front can see my copy is dog-eared. Uh, it's titled The Climate Casino, 
risk uncertainty and economics for a, for a warming world. Uh, it's really an excellent, uh, excellent book, uh, both as a matter of economic analysis, but it's also, perhaps rarely for an economist, very well written. Uh, and uh, I think is uh, quite, access quite access accessible uh, uh, on many levels, so I recommend it highly. Um, so without further ado, uh, let, me introduce, uh, let, let, let me introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Professor Nordhaus. Uh, the format will be the following. Uh, Professor Nordhaus will speak for about 30 minutes, uh, and then uh, I may ask him a question or two. We'll have a little discussion. Uh, and then we'll open up the floor uh, to questions and answers. And, and will we have an, a microphone available for people? Okay, so, so uh, Bill? Uh, good afternoon. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm very delighted to be here. I'm a big, big admirer of the University of Chicago. I'm a big admirer of, uh, of Milton Friedman and Gary Becker. And uh, something that Steve doesn't know, uh, my gracious host for the day, is that the project I'm working on is actually um, about Milton Friedman. That's another one. I'm, it's not a global warming topic, but you have the Becker Friedman Institute, we have the William F. Buckley Institute at Yale. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, one of my projects, uh, sort of late at night when the house is quiet and the children are asleep, not that they're any children, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, everybody's asleep, is to start uh, thinking about Milton Friedman, God and man, are at Yale and other such subjects. But that's not today's topic. Um, so I'm, I'm very delighted to be here, as I said. Uh, it's um, a great university, and uh, many, many inspirational people um, have worked here and work here. And the, the, the history of um, both uh, Friedman and Becker, but also others here, has really informed um, the way uh, I think, and the way we think at Yale and, and around the country. So today what I'd like to do is, with you, is talk about some economic perspectives on climate change. Um, and uh, so this is a kind of introduction to what I want to say. First, so many of these things you will know. All of you will probably know something, and some of you will probably know everything but um, perhaps some of this will be new. So you, I know, are aware of the fact that global warming and climate change is a big uh, controversial area. It's a global issue. It's a costly issue. It has large impacts. There's recently been a review by the, this international group of scientists, economists, ecologists, and others uh, with these three volumes of the fifth assessment report. Um, I read as much as I could uh, without, you know, it's a very, very long set of volumes. But uh, it basically continues to um, update us on the science and the impacts and what we can do about it. Uh, if I had to give a short summary, it's that things that we thought were going to happen 10 and 20 years ago are happening. They're not happening exactly the way we thought because there are large uncertainties, but there are no major, major um, surprises that have come up since 2007. Um, one of the things about climate change, it affects virtually every area of the society and the economy. I, I'm looking here at the lake. Um, I was actually trying to find what it said about Lake Michigan, um, but we do know that the inland waterways of a country like this are going to be uh, significantly affected. Um, it's a little hard to figure out exactly how, how because it's going to depend on uh, very uh, uncertain aspects of climatology and also how we react to them. Uh, now, the one thing I want to emphasize as an economist is one of the innovations in this area, uh, which is the use of market mechanisms and instruments, and particularly the use of carbon pricing in climate change. 
This is something that nobody would have dreamed of 20 years ago. So that's something that actually is new in the last few years. The idea that how you fix something is you don't say, do this to a company or do that to a consumer, but to use the indirect mechanism, the price mechanism, in particular this strange thing called carbon pricing as a way of affecting the economy. So let me talk a little bit. Um, so I want to talk first about um, just give you some background on the science and what's happening there, science and, and emissions. Um, there's some factual basis that I think is absolutely essential. Some, uh, so I'll start with that. Then I'm going to talk a little about what economists do and economic models. Any of you who know economists know that we love models. That's what we do for a living. Uh, we build models. I'll talk a little about those. And then I'll talk at the end about some of the policy aspects and some of the dilemmas we face. So let me start with global CO2 emissions. I hope you can see that in the back there. But this is global CO2 emissions since as best we can reconstruct them from 1900 to uh, the uh, 2011. Um, and they, they go, there's a little wiggle in that. Uh, this is on a ratio scale, so a straight line is a, is a constant rate of growth. Uh, CO2 emissions have been growing at about 2.5% a year since 1900. Um, there's been no let up uh, in the last few years. Uh, if anything, they've probably grown a little more rapidly. So this is really, this is where humans are entering the system by primarily burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, which leads to these CO2 emissions. One of the interesting questions is, well, what is behind this? Well, it, one of the interesting factors is we're actually becoming more efficient in terms of our emissions. That's to say, our emissions per unit of output are actually declining pretty sharply. And um, going back to, say, 1930, these are US data where we have pretty good data, um, there's been a pretty substantial decrease in the carbon intensity of the economy, so decarbonization, if you like, a little under 2% a year. Uh, that's been going on over most of this period. Partly that's because we're becoming more energy efficient in our energy use. We're getting more output per unit of energy input. Partly it's because the change of composition from things like heating to things like uh, computers or finance from high carbon intensity sectors to low carbon intensity sectors. But this is this trend, one to two percent per year of decarbonization, is not enough to offset the growth of the economy of two, three, or four percent a year, either in the US or globally. So the global growth is e of CO2 emissions as a whole, which was on the last slide, is in a way, the sum of the growth of the, of the total economy less the decarbonization. And that has been a positive number and looks to be a positive number as far as we can project. So the effect of that, those emissions, is that the carbon dioxide concentrates in the atmosphere. It has a very long residence time. It, it isn't radioactive and doesn't have a half-life like, uh, like a radioactive substance. It's, it's a more complicated dynamics. But I think it, to a first approximation, you can think of the, the average lifetime of about 100 years. To, that's to say long. You put CO2 in the atmosphere, it stays a long time. And what we see here is in the little wiggly red line, uh, in the, is our direct monitoring of atmospheric carbon, uh, carbon dioxide in Hawaii, and which has been since 1957. And you can see that just keeps going steadily up over time. There's a little seasonal pattern because of vegetation. There's a little South Pole number there to see what it looks like at different places in the Earth. But 
this, this is basically, this is the basic driver of climate change, the atmospheric concentrations of CO2, and there are other, it's called a greenhouse gas, and there are other greenhouse gases, but you don't really need to know about anything but this one, at least for today. Uh, you might wonder what it's looked like over time. Is this a big deal? Well, actually, it is a big deal. These are, we have pretty good data on atmospheric concentrations from ice cores over the last roughly million years. So the axis there shows time going backwards and um, uh, the history to the left. And this shows the concentrations of carbon dioxide as, as in the ice cores back to for 800,000 years. They go up and down over time, primarily because of ice ages. Uh, as you can see from that red line, which is we're up today at about 400, is way above where they've been any time in the last million years. So this is, this is not just the normal random variation. Uh, this is something quite extraordinary by recent standards. Now, you go back far enough, you have higher levels, go back to the dinosaurs, but for the history of human civilizations, humans as we know them today, uh, as you know us today, uh, this, is, this is the CO2 level we've been living with. Um, let me turn to temperature. We, temperature records are more difficult. We, don't, we have proxy records of those. They're, they're OK. They're not that great. Um, but um, a, a scientist by the name of Michael Mann put together proxy records they go further back, but this is probably the best one going back uh, to about, this shows back to 600 uh, AD. Up, and this is his reconstruction up till 1950. And this is, um, those are tenths of a degree centigrade on the vertical axis. So you can, if you can't see it in the back, that's from minus 0.4 to essentially zero is the variation over the last uh, 1,300 years, 1,400 years. So that's, that's a reconstruction. And now let's put on top of that the instrumental record. And these are put together by different research groups around the world. Uh, pretty reliable. Actually, I, I once went and checked them just because I'm curious. And you can see, uh, so I, th I think these are accurate records. They're not perfect, but they're pretty accurate. And you can see. If you compare what happened over the longer span, uh, that has been this kind of discontinuity in the temperature record. Uh, so I think this is pretty important because when people say, well, whatever they say, I won't say all the things they say, um, but that nothing is happening or nothing important is happening or it's not that big or whatever. And I think this is, this is what I have in my mind. Um, as what's happened over the last 1,500 years. Now, i just say one thing about the more recent record. So that, um, again, I apologize if you can't see it in the back, but we have there, the Whitley line is, again, that actual temperature record, tr instrumental record, um, and the red line is from a, a model that is used to take inputs and project what global temperature would be. And it's, it's, it's just a representative model, but it, it's similar to other climate models. So these, I'll just say a word about climate models. Now, climate models are basically huge, um, huge multi-line, you know, millions of lines of code. And what they do is they, they take as inputs things like this, what's happening to the solar variation in volcanoes and the temperature of the oceans and the geography of mountains. And they, do, they just do the physics. They just run forward conservation of energy, conservation of mass, conservation of this and that. And they just grind it out over time. And they do it on tiny little time steps. And it takes forever on supercomputers. And there are a bunch of them around Chicago. So you have your own models. And so this is just, this is just a, an example of that. So, what I, so they track reasonably well. But if you look at the right, if you can see that, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon that over the last decade, the global temperature has been flat. That's to say there's, it's been trendless for about 10 years. Um, 
models have it going up pretty sharply, roughly two to three degrees per decade, and it's been going up at zero per decade. So this is a kind of crisis. Um, the, the modelers, so the critics say, ah, I, should, I, I told you nothing was happening, the globe is not warming, and the modelers say, well, you know, it's a noisy, you know, it's like the recession, you don't, just because output, just because employment is where it was six years ago, doesn't mean employment never grows. So the, but I think the main thing is it's, we do see periods like this in the past where you've seen big anomalies. Uh, if you look at the period around the 1930 to 1950 period, you had a, a decl sharp decline in global temperature. So this is a kind of, there's a lot of internal noise in the climate system. Um, and I'm not gonna try to explain it because I don't understand it, but it is, it's, you may have heard about it and there it is. Okay, so um, that's the first step in the process. I spent a little time on that. And now let me, let me move on to talk a little bit about impacts of climate change. So presumably we, we're, we don't care that much about carbon dioxide going up because it's, it doesn't bother anybody. Uh, and if the temperature was going up by one degree, we probably wouldn't even notice it. But there are impacts all around in different places. And, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I'll give you three of them that are kind of interesting. Um, first, let me say that we don't, we don't actually have a good handle on at what point the impacts would become dangerous. But it's a common view, which was adopted by governments at Copenhagen and since then, at a, a grand meeting, uh, that a temperature rise of two degrees C was um, the, the maximum that would be tolerable. And so that's been in the, in the part of government policies and part of the scientific community uh, for the last, um, last five years. Um, now, uh, this is actually the most difficult area of all of the things I'm going to talk about. It's the one that's least understood, or the one that's most difficult to understand. Because what we're, I mean, you, if you think about it, it is pretty difficult. Because what you're doing is you're taking something that might happen 50 or 100 years from now, according to a model. You're imposing on a system, not today, which we more or less understand, but a system that is going to change in ways we don't understand. The human economy, human populations, ecologies 50 to 100 years from now. Um, and with the, in, the impacts, let's say the, the relative changes of those being poorly understood. So the impacts is, is, uh, is, is a very difficult area. I think it's, it's just a nightmare for, for people who are trying to understand what's going on. But it's critical, because if there were no impacts, then we wouldn't even be here this afternoon. So let me talk about uh, three of those. Uh, so one is agriculture. Uh, many people, so if you look at many reports, they, they worry about the possibility of um, big declines in food supplies, temperature increase, starvation, environmental migration, conflicts, and so on. But if you actually look at the, what the, this is from the latest, latest report that just came out, uh, it's actually a little more complicated than that. And let me just, so uh, what this has is a bunch of dots. And then if you can see it, there are two lines there. There's a brown line that says what will happen to yields if there's no adaptation. And there's a blue line that says what will happen with ad adaptation. And what is adaptation? Adaptation means if you're a farmer, it means you will change your planting date. That's an adaptation. You will change your cultivar, that's to say what you plant, that's an adaptation. You might actually go out of business and set up a golf course, that's an adaptation. <laughs> so for my taste, I don't know why anybody would even think about, I mean, a farmer not being adaptive. Um, and so that's, kind of, but most of the studies actually, um, and the reports look at agriculture without adaptation. If you actually look at this is low latitude rice, an extremely important crop. And according to this study, um, actually the yield increases 
at every temperature level that they investigate. So what's another crop, maybe more interesting to people here, is temperate zone wheat. Uh, same story. Uh, uh, without adaptation, you have, a, you have a big hit on yields. And with adaptation, actually, you have a positive increase in yields with temperature. So this is one of the diff most difficult things, is actually to, to in each area to think, OK, we, we can ask what would happen to today if you whack the system with a temperature increase. But then you have to ask, well, how is the system going to adapt? Are people going to migrate if it's too hot? Are you going to change, your, are you change what you plant? What are you going to do forestry management practices? And until you've done that, you really haven't measured impacts. Um, now, a second one is, uh, is a, I want to move to two that are quite different. So I was talking about agriculture, which involves humans, and humans are very adaptive. But here's one where this a little more difficult, uh, and this is species extinction. Um, so the people who work on this, the conservation biologists and the alike, have looked very carefully at different areas and project major, a major increase in the rate of extinction over the next century plus, this is per century, relative to the last 500 years. So this shows in the bottom birds, sharks, crustaceans, mammals, corals, reptiles, conifers, amphibians, bivalves, and snails. And the blue lines, which you, the blue bars, which you probably can't see, are in the range of, sort of 0 to 1% per century. That's the last 500 years. As you can see, the projections for the next century or beyond are, are very high. So these extinction rates from 10 to 50% for Given, given families. Um, I think these are, so the, the methodology here is a problem is everything. You have to think about adaptation and so on. But this is one area where this is stood up, this is stood up to pretty careful scrutiny and is probably one of the most worrisome areas of all the impacts we've looked at. And then uh, a final area of impacts is what are sometimes called tipping points or catastrophic risks. And here, these are the potential for large Earth system effects, sort of global effects of things that could have widespread impacts. And there, are, I'll just mention five, and I'm going to show you one picture. Uh, one is the reversal, which is probably more worrisome in Connecticut than it is in Chicago. But the reversal of the North Atlantic deep water circulation, which basically would, would warms the northern part of the Atlantic community. Um, one which is definitely going to have a big impact on, Chicago, on the Chicago area is the melting of the summer Arctic ice cap, which will, is gradually thinning and will almost surely melt in the next 30 years. Um, then there's the melting of the giant ice sheets in Greenland and, and West Antarctica. And then the final one is, I won't skip the fourth, is what's happening to the carbon, carbonization of the ocean and the change in ocean chemistry becoming more and more, lowering the pH level for the gardeners, lowering the pH level in the ocean. I'm just going to show you one picture. So one of the ones I think that has captured people most dramatic, uh, to capture people's imagination is the melting of the Greenland ice cap. That's a very, very gigantic piece of ice, let me tell you. Um, and if it were all to melt, it would raise the level of the oceans by 22, 23 feet, which comes to my house. So uh, on, a, on a high tide, it would be at my house. I wouldn't be here. So that sounds pretty scary, right? Right. So here's an interesting study. Of, um, so there have been actually lots of studies on the Greenland ice sheet. And in the most recent report, um, I think they have it pretty well understood, I mean, within the normal margins of error of science. So here's what they think will happen. So this is year zero. And the question is, how fast is it going to melt? So the year zero, where the volume is 100% of what it is now. And this just shows you. What will happen? What they project happening over the next few centuries? 
So this is a pretty substantial warming, six degree local warming. And you can see it does melt back pretty sharply over this period, but it's pretty slow. And so year 270, you've lost 220%, roughly a meter, roughly five feet of ocean. Um, one of the things, however, people particularly worry about is there's some kind of tipping point that what, once you go beyond a point that it'll just continue the rest of the way. What's going on? How are we? I've sort of lost track of time. Time. 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. So this gives you a flavor for the impacts, but I, I've just this is this is just a tiny snapshot of a tiny bit of them. There there are impacts in many many different areas. Um, there are human there are parts of the human economy of our economy, agriculture being the most important, but other ones are sensitive like forestry and fisheries. Then there are non-market impacts, um, skiing, boating. Then there are ecological impacts, and those things like species loss, and those become very, very difficult to, to measure and to understand. I think I'll skip this. So um, let me say a little bit about what economists do, and then I'll go to the, to the end. Um, economists um, uh, have, have tackled this area by putting together modeling efforts or models which integrate different parts. And so what they try to do is integrate the human economy that, that we know with the physical, physical climate systems and the carbon cycle and what we know about the impacts and then finally uh, linking back to potential policies. So this, is, uh, this has been a pretty big enterprise of economists now for uh, maybe 20 years. There, there are dozens of them around the world, working on, of us working around the world in different models, like the climate models, if you like. Um, and what do they find? Well, let me, let me, I'm just gonna, so um, let me, this will give you a picture, I'll just go to one, give you a picture of one, one of the models shows uh, for different scenarios of policies what the temperature would look like. So for example, in the model, they project a business as usual policy would be one where the temperature would rise to between three and four degrees over the century, but then continue after that because of the inertia in the system. And then the economists look at different policies, such as one that balanced the costs and benefits, the damages and the costs of abatements. Which, which I've labeled the optimal here. And that limits, that sort of steps on the brake uh, a little bit. Um, and then another one, which is the one that the policymakers have endorsed, which is limit the temperature to two degrees C, and that obviously stops at two degrees C. Now, probably the most important thing that economists emphasize is this strange thing called a carbon price or a CO2 price. And the basic idea is that we currently don't penalize people, whether you or me or a firm or a university or a university club, when it emits a greenhouse gas like CO2 into the atmosphere. It's free. Right? There's no charge on it. But in fact, it's doing damage. It's doing damage in terms of those impacts that we talked about. So what economists emphasize for things like this, which are external effects or spillover effects, is the importance of putting a price tag on it. So I think that's something that economists pretty, I mean, you, you have to make sure it's, you got the science right, you have to make sure you're not exaggerating it, but it's, it's pretty consensual among economists that if you have a big spillover effect, that one of the ways, not the only way, but one of the ways to correct it is put a price on it. Now, one of the problems is, what kind of price would you put on CO2? Like a dollar, a hundred dollars, a zillion dollars, who knows? So the, the big contribution of economics has been to build models which actually estimate that. And here's an example from one model, which shows what kind of CO2 price 
you would need to get the different uh, objectives. For example, if you don't have any objective, you don't have to do anything. If you want to limit it to two degrees C to take of the highest one, then you need a carbon price in the current period of about uh, $45 a ton. Now, just to put that in perspective, um, that is approximately, just, just order of magnitude, that approximately adds that amount to a ton of coal. It's not quite right, but it's order of magnitude. So if you're having coal today that sells for maybe $10 a ton, as it does in this country, then you're adding a substantial amount to the price of coal. And that would obviously be a big in disincentive for any utility was thinking of using coal. And the other factor about that is that you see that is rising over time. So you gradually are screwing, you're sort of tightening the screws, if you like, on the system. And you're trying to get the emissions down further and further over time. I just would, in case you're wondering where we are today, you can see that at the bottom there. Uh, we're nowhere today. Just That's where the world is today. In terms of the carbon price, it's about a dollar a ton. I think I'm going to just, I uh, think I'll probably, I just want to say one more word about um, what a con I've said this before, but I just want to spell it out a little bit more. So there are different options about what you can do. You might subsidize bad things, good things like R&D or wind or solar. You might regulate cars or power plants. Uh, you might cap emissions. But on the whole, the favorite thing of economists would be a, something that raises the price, and in particular, something called a carbon tax. And I think actually Gary Becker wrote a column on the, the great virtues of a carbon tax. And the idea is really simple. That what you do is you put a tax on each good and service proportional to its CO2 content. So if coal has a lot of CO2, it gets a high tax. If being an educator and speaker at conferences or, or events like this has a low carbon content, then it has a low CO2 tax. Uh, the highest, just for your information, the highest tax activities would be electricity generation and iron and steel. And the lowest tax would be telecommunications and computers, computer services. And that's because they differ by orders, literally orders of magnitude in how much CO2 is involved in them. Um, a second point is that this has to be harmonized across everywhere, across countries, across industries, across people. No special deals for farmers or fishermen or whatever. And then the third point is, of course, everybody hates taxes, I suppose, particularly this time of year. But um, this, this can be a revenue neutral tax. That's to say you could raise this tax and lower other taxes. And I like to say, look, why do we tax goods like labor and, and capital? Why not tax bads like carbon and sulfur pollution? Why not tax the bads and reduce the tax on the goods? And so that's one of the ideas of tax substitution, that you can actually you get two birds with one tax. You get to lower the carbon emissions, but you also get to substitute that for other taxes. Well, I think that's where I'll end it. Uh, I have one more graph here. Uh, this is a graph. That, that's all, folks. For me. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Uh, that, that was great. Um, so you uh, summarized for us some of the evidence um, of rising CO2 levels and global warming.
uh, you discussed uh, some of the impacts and the uncertainties associated with assessing uh, those impacts. And you sketched the case for um, uh, essentially a global universal carbon tax. Um, and I think uh, from an economic perspective, uh, the, the, the case for a carbon tax scheme is, uh, is quite compelling. You can see this case laid out much more fully in the book um, that I referred to earlier. But as you also noted, we've made uh, extremely limited progress towards that ideal, um, which I'm going to describe as a global carbon tax, universal in the sense that it taxes all, all forms of CO2 on the margin the same everywhere. Um, and you know, we, you gave a seminar today in which, we, in which we talked some about this. And, you went through the experience with the Kyoto Protocol and uh, that you know, began in 1994 and was, a, was an effort by, I guess, most of the countries in the world, or many of them, um, to participate in um, an effort worldwide to lower CO2 levels. I think it's fair to say that was a spectacular failure. And um, that hasn't worked, and it's reflected in the little red dot you showed. So I'd like to then take you to like the political economy of making progress. Which and, and get your thoughts on, not not so much from the world perspective, but from the perspective of a U.S. policymaker, because policies are mostly made at the national level. What do you think is the single most important next step we could take, assuming that our long-run goal is this notion of a universal, um, comprehensive uh, CO2 tax? Uh, thanks, Steve. Those are great, great observation and a great question. So. I have a very simple answer. I think the US should enact a carbon tax. It's, it's very simple. Uh, it's very straightforward. I think it's, um, I'll say a little bit about why I think it's the right thing to do and, and other things are not the right thing to do. But I think the main thing is that we've got to get started. We can't wait for any utopian global successor to the League of Nations or whatever. Um, and the U.S., as we all often say, the richest and most powerful country in the world, uh, has to start. And I think it's ludicrous to think that India or China or Brazil are going to take costly steps when the U.S. is doing nothing. So I think the U.S. doesn't necessarily have to do it alone, but it has to be in the first wave. Now, why a carbon tax? Well, this comes from you were very, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I'm gracious to say, not to say that I came to Yale in 1967. <laughs> so that's a long time ago, but it also gives you a kind of perspective that I, I, I've lived through events that other people see in the history books, or if they read the history books. But one of the things that I really am convinced is you have to be patient. You just have to don't, I mean, you have to be realistic, but don't compromise away your principles because you think, I think, you think you're uh, politically realistic and you know how the political system works and you think that you can get where you're going to go through some roundabout way. And I'll just tell one story. Uh, in, um, in the late 70s, I was in the I was the Council of Economic Advisors, which was an advisor to President Carter. And we were just starting at that point regulatory reform. And we proposed the idea at the Council of Economic Advisors that if a plant has two smokestacks and one is putting up a lot of pollution, the other is putting up a little, that you ought to be able to conceptually put a bubble over that and if you can reduce one by 100 units, you could increase the other by 100 units. So this is kind of a, this is the precursor of emissions trading. And we were met with disdain. Immoral, unrealistic, what are you doing? You're gonna, you know, just all kinds of what I regard as bogus arguments. But, you know, after, this was 1977, by 1990, the environmentalists had embraced this idea, and it was written into law. So 
I think we just have to be patient. Now, to come back to the carbon tax, what are the alternatives? Subsidies. So one of the things we've learned in careful studies of subsidies is they're not very effective. And I'll give you one example. We just, there was just a, a study completed by the National Academy of Sciences that looked at the effect of the ethanol subsidy on CO2 emissions. Now, I assumed that if you subsidize ethanol and it replaces gasoline, it's got to have less CO2 emissions. Well, it turns out as you work through all the analysis because of the complexity of it, it actually increased CO2 emissions. The ethanol subsidy, I'll just repeat that, it's just like, it's backwards, but the ethanol subsidy, according to the models that were used, persuasively increased CO2 emissions. So that kind of, that kind of ended my love affair with subsidies. <laughs> then there's cap and trade. Well, cap and trade is okay, it's a, it's a second best, but it's only a second best, and it actually is a very difficult, it, it, it's just complicated. I mean, taxing is so simple. I mean, we may hate it, but it's simple. You don't have to create a whole new agency to do it. You don't have to, like, have all kinds of new devices and things. And you just, it's just a tax. It's just a tax. It's, so it's so simple administratively. Every country knows how to tax. No country knows how to do cap and trade except a few rich countries. And, and, and even then, they don't know how to do it very well. So I think this, this is a case where the right answer is the simple answer. Thanks. I was going to ask you about to explain to the audience why you prefer um, carbon taxing directly rather than cap and trade, but you just answered that question. <laughs> and I, 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 I think it's an important point. So l let me open it up at this point. Um, Amy, w w do we have a microphone yes. that will come around? So um, Amy, uh, if you want to raise your hand, uh, and I think it's a big room, so uh, perhaps stand up if you'd like to ask a question. Um, and do just a couple of ground rules. First, please identify yourself. Uh, and second, do get to a question uh, in, in short order. Um, my name is Michael Stavey. You were talking about rice production, and you mentioned that uh, a rice farmer could uh, convert into a uh, golf course. I don't see how that uh, maintains the amount of rice produced. Uh, I, That's in adaptation. Okay, so I, actually I, uh, if I, I said that, joke. If I said a rice, I, I don't think I actually said that, but if, if that was my implication, I wasn't talking about rice farmers to, to, uh, turning into um, golf courses. The, the point I was making was actually a general one, which is that when you look at the impacts, say, of a temperature change or precipitation change or soil moisture change on a particular area, you have to you have to take into account that the, that the human actors there, the p decision makers, are intelligent, crafty, and they're going to adjust their operations to the changing environment. Maybe not in a minute, maybe not in an hour, but we're talking about 50 years. Okay? And the idea that as one study assumed, an Iowa farmer who's planting wheat would, after 50 years, with temperature and precipitation change, would continue to plant wheat at the same time every year with the same water inputs and the same fertilizer input year after year, when you not actually wouldn't even be there after 50 years. It's just implausible. So the point was that adaptation is a key part of understanding impacts, but it's also very difficult because we, it's hard to, this is what makes impacts analysis so difficult. It's hard to project exactly what the, a good set of adaptations are, partly because we don't know what the world's going to look like, and partly because we don't know what the technology is going to look like. Is it possible there is no adaptation? Is it possible there is? Is it? You know, of course, anything's possible, but it seems to me that we know we have hundreds and hundreds of studies of farmers in this country and other countries over time, and we know farmers adapt. 
We know farmers don't just do the same thing year after year. So I think the best, the best, almost surely the best bet is adaptive. But as I said, what exactly the adaptation is, is a more complicated and difficult story. Yes, we've got a question back here, three rows back. Is the only reason for carbon tax to discourage emission, or can the money be used for research that will solve some of the problems in another, another way? That's a really good question. So the, the, there are two broad sets of reasons um, for carbon tax. One is, I mean, there are actually one set, but I, I focus on two things. One is to give incentives to consumers and businesses and governments um, to give them signals, to give them incentives to change their behavior. So for example, I'm quite confident that if electric utilities are given signals that coal is 10 times more expensive or C because CO2 emissions are much more expensive, that they're going to change the behavior in lots of ways. One is to retire, just for example, retire your coal plant and replace it with a gas-fired plant. So that's the basic incentive, is to get people to change their behavior. But the other thing about a car, second part about that is it does it in ways that are both even-handed and gives incentives for the people who can reduce it least expensively to do it. So let's say utility can, re can reduce a unit of emissions for a dollar a ton, whereas I, it would cost me $100, say, with a new refrigerator. Then I would say, no, thank you. I'll just keep my refrigerator, whereas electric utility faced with a carbon price would actually do it. So you give incentives for the people who can change their behavior and reduce their emissions most effect economically to do it. Just one other thing, though. This is kind of a subtle point, but I think in the long run very important. And uh, Steve and I have talked about this earlier. And it gives incentives to inventors and investors where to put your research and development money for new technologies. Just to give one example, there's a technology that will take the CO2 out of a stack, you know, or it could do it beforehand, but let's say just simply, it's, it's like taking CO2 out of a stack and remove it and pump it down somewhere. It costs money. No utility in its right mind would do that today with a zero carbon tax. But you would have an incentive to do it in the future, except for the fact the technology isn't available. So if you had a high tax, then the people who develop these new technologies, whether it's carbon, or it's wind, or it's solar, or it's other technologies we've never heard of, they have an incentive to do the basic, to do the applied research, and the development, and the commercialization. So it's a really quite a subtle idea that it gives a whole range of incentives uh, across the board for people to take actions which in the long run reduce the carbon intensity of the economy. We had another hand up in the third row there. Oh, OK, you got so sorry. I may not have the right, but I have the mic. Uh, <laughs> Mike, John, right. John Rowe, retired utility executive, and longtime carbon tax fan. Uh, Professor Nordhaus, have you uh, looked at the cost per ton of existing state renewable portfolio standards compared to your carbon tax numbers? OK, so um, nice to see you again. If you remember, we were on a panel together many years ago. Um, so there, there's a complicated, I don't want to get into too much of this, but there's a complicated set of rules in different states that require electric utilities to have a mix of 
of green and non-green technologies. It's a simple way of putting it. Um, now the question is, how cost effective is that? Is that a good way of doing it? Is that a, I, I, we did, there was, uh, I, I think the short answer is I don't have a clear fix on that. In the National Caddy, there have been a couple of committees that have looked at that and they get inconsistent results. Um, so I, I think I'll just sort of say that I, I don't know the answer and the research on this is ambiguous. Hi, one of the most fascinating graphs you had um, was the one ver that, that compared doing nothing with optimal and then the uh, 2% yep. per year. Could you, for us, give us a, whatever level you can, the difference between optimal, what, what, what that looks like? Yeah. Uh, Thank you. So, so what, so the optimal, so what, what um, the optimal is, is basically just does a kind of cost benefit analysis. It looks at what the estimates of the impacts are, which I didn't get to, but I had more time I would have, how much it costs to have climate change at different de degrees, so one degree, two degree, three degree, four degree, what it costs the economy, what it costs to reduce, emissions so you stay below that, and then asks uh, what's the, the best way to balance the costs of doing abatement against the damages of not doing the abatement. And so the numbers that are used in this modeling and in most other modeling finds that that ends up with a temperature trajectory that's a little above, like one degree above the two degree. The two degree is just an arbitrary number that somebody, well, uh, it's a complicated history of where it came from, um, but it's just an arbitrary number, like um, says, don't go faster than 50 miles an hour. And what the cost benefit thing does is, well, okay, maybe 20 downtown and 90 in Wyoming, uh, but it depends, you're gonna to balance the different considerations. Does that help? Yes. It is online, and uh, uh, you can email me at william.nordhouse at yale.edu, um, and I will. And there's a nice spreadsheet model that, uh, if you know Excel, you can use in a very small number of minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know you're an economist, but you have some understanding of politics, having worked in the Carter administration. So this is all lovely from an economic point of view, but from the political point of view, do you see any of this being implemented in our lifetimes? <laughs> or in recent history, given what's going on well, in I, Congress? I don't, uh, you look like you have a long life expectancy. <laughs> so, you know, um, I'm, an, I'm an economist. I'm not, uh, I'm not a political scientist, but I'll tell you what my political scientist, I have some really very talented colleagues at Yale. And so when I say something like, oh it's, a, oh, it's so sad, it's so depressing, nothing ever happens, you know, it's like country's going to the dogs, and whatever it is. And he, he says to me, you know, and I say, you know, and I ask that question actually, uh, you know, can we ever get in? He says, you know, you never know. That's, he says, that's the thing about po politics and politicians. They can change their minds so quickly. Uh, who would have thought that Congress would adopt a cap and trade program on sulfur in 1990? Who would have thought that Congress would have adopted a very, very stringent control on ozone depleting chemicals, as I remember, passed the Senate unanimously? Who would have thought? So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm an educator, so my view is, look, I'll just, I'll try to explain people what I think that what the um, the good points and the bad points are, but I'll make one other point on the carbon tax. We came within a whisker of a carbon tax when we had the deficit panels 
There were two deficit panels, actually three. And I talked to somebody who is, a, who is an economist who was on the panel. And this person said to me, we had two things. We knew we needed some additional revenues. And we had two alternatives. One was a value-added tax, and the other was a carbon tax. And it was neck and neck. And we voted for a value-added tax because we thought people had heard of it. <laughs> OK? Well, OK. So go around. Talk to your friends. Tell your friends to talk to their friends. Start chain letters. And then maybe the next deficit panel, people say, oh, yeah, carbon tax. I've heard of that. Let's do that. The fact is we need revenues. And at some point in the future, maybe there'll be an alliance between the, the people who care about environment and global warming and the people who don't care about it but think we need revenues and say, hey, let's, let's try this. Bob Rosner, uh, Energy Policy Institute at the university. Um, I'd like to follow up on your point about revenue, uh, revenue neutral tax and uh, a possible either intended or unintended consequence. Imagine that the tax is wildly successful. And that means that in time, the revenue will plummet. You hope it will plummet. Um, have you thought about the consequence for the federal budget uh, for that kind of scenario? Would that we were so lucky. <laughs> OK, just to be clear, I, 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 let me make sure I interpret you correctly. So you raise a carbon tax, and the tax revenue is the tax rate times the emissions. And you raise it a little higher. So this is a Laffer, La, Arthur Laffer. He was, was he here? Yes, he's at he University of Chicago. <laughs> University of Chicago invented the Laffer curve. So what you're asking is, what about the Laffer curve for the carbon tax? Would we be so lucky? Uh, that that's our problem, that we've actually reduced emissions so far that the tax revenue has gone down. Uh, so what, I'd say not in my lifetime, <laughs> probably not in your lifetime, but that's the whole point of it, actually. And then at that point, we move on to the next thing. But, but that, that is a point. That's a good point. Well, I, actually, what I, what I really was curious about was if it's revenue neutral, you basically would be substituting <laughs> for tax that would not have changed with time. So, so, so just to be really concrete, let's say 30 years from now, the revenues peaked and started to go down, and you cut some other tax, social security tax, or a personal income tax, or something, then you'd, you know, at that point, you'd have to raise it. But, but look, um, you still have, you can't have less revenue than zero. So you're starting out with a zero base. So you're raising revenue along the way. Do, do, Amy, do we have time for more? Or? I think we're done. Okay, so maybe we should all go out and get a carbon tax bumper sticker so <laughs> people know what it is. Put carbon tax on your Facebook page and, and so on. Thanks a lot, Bill. That was great.